the momentum in the in for the lions or whatever you know or whatever something something along those lines. So so we we hear that word in in a couple of different where areas. And in physics, the word is um, kind of, again, kind of the same sort of feel, sort of the same sort of idea, um, that, that we're going to take some movement and we're going to get it going a little bit, OK? Uh, you know, when I think about it going. The concept of momentum is, um, <coughs> with, with physics is taking a massive object, whatever mass it might be, it could be small mass, large mass, whatever, but it's taking an object that has mass and getting it moving, all right? And that is velocity. And so what we have here is a really, really, really simple uh, mathematical formula, a really, very simple mathematical idea. But I hope what it does is it explains some motion of, of some particles, some motion of some objects. And so we can really kind of focus in on just how they're moving. Um, for momentum, uh, for some reason, we use the letter P as the symbol. Um, not sure why, but that's, that's what it is. And then, uh, of course, mass and velocity are, are, are M and V. So pretty simple little formula. P equals M over V. And the units are pretty simple also, because mass is always measured in kilograms, velocity in meters per second. So therefore, momentum is just kilogram meters per second and there's no other fancy name for it, okay? Now, we can, we can stop here and kind of call attention to the fact that when we, when we started off the year with, with moving things, then we talked about uh, uh, an idea where we took mass times acceleration. And that, of course, is, is uh, how Sir Isaac Newton defined force. A little bit different, but a little bit the same. You know, still, still we're trying to think about, let's get something moving, and what kind of force do we apply? Here, we actually have to be moving. Okay, we actually have to be moving. Um, as, as opposed to with a force, remember, we don't always have to be moving uh, to have a force being applied depending upon the, the frame of reference. But here, we do have to have something moving. So momentum is, is, a, is, a, is a measurement that we make uh, of a moving object. Okay, so it has to be some sort of moving object in order to have momentum. All right? Which again, like I said, is a little different than, than when we talked about the concept of force. I'm going to use Sir Isaac Newton's <coughs> equation, though, to help us relate this then to uh, uh, our, our, our other measurement that we're going to make, which is called impulse. Okay? So let me do a little mathematical um, manipulation here for you. Sir Isaac Newton, of course, said that F is equal to MA. And if we take a look at the very, very basic definition of acceleration, Acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time. Okay, so if I'm accelerating my car, my velocity is changing over a period of time. I'm getting faster and faster and faster, or maybe I'm getting slower and slower and slower. Okay, so if I do a little plugging in here, all right, I'm going to substitute A for A, then my force <coughs> would be equal to mass times the change in velocity over the change in time. Okay. So I just took A and I substituted in what we would define A for. Okay, A is, A is change in velocity over change in time. And so I've got a nice little equation here. And I'm going to cross multiply. Force times the change in time is equal to mass times velocity. Okay? Force times the change in time is equal to the mass times the velocity. All right? So far so good? Pretty easy little algebraic manipulation. So what did we just do? Well, we just defined this as momentum. Okay, this is the momentum, and that is uh, the momentum of an object that is moving. So I've got a moving object, all right, and it has this concept that we call momentum. So what's this stuff on the other side of the equal sign? Well, this stuff on the other side of the equal sign is force times the change in time force times the change of time, which is a concept which we're going to call the impulse, okay? If I were naming it, I would have, I would have called it the impact, okay? And, uh, but, 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 but it's called the impulse. And the impulse, by definition, is taking uh, an object of some sort and uh, <coughs> applying a force to it, okay? Some sort of object is going to have a force applied to it, and 
um, we're going to multiply that force that we apply to that object times the amount of time that we come in contact with it. So we're going to write this down as the contact time. Okay? So this idea of impulse is really an idea about uh, a measurement, if you will, a measurement of some sort of collision. Whether it's a collision of a car running into a brick wall, or a collision of a bat running into a ball in a baseball game, or a golf club hitting a golf ball, or you running into a wall as you, as you, try, to, as you try to catch a ball on, uh, in the outfield of a baseball game. So, so all kinds of different collisions. Um, we're going to apply forces, and, and what we want to look at is, is this idea of, of how much contact time. Well, we tried to do uh, an experiment with that yesterday uh, with, our, uh, with, with our, uh, our legs. If you look at your number one uh, discovery there, um, when I ask you to um, jump off the chair, and, and most of us, when we jump off the chair, do it, and we bend our knees, okay? And, and, and we've got to think about it for a second, well, why, why do we bend our knees? And it's real simple to answer that question, just jump off the chair and don't bend your knees. And you'll know why you do it, because it hurts. It hurts a lot. And what I want to tell you here is, um, well, I'm going to give you an explanation about why we do that in a physics realm and relate these ideas. Now notice up on the wall here uh, that I've written down P equals MV, which equals I, which equals F change in time. So, I, and I tried to show you here how we can mathematically come up with this whole idea of momentum, which is the measurement of a moving object, and impulse, which is the measurement of a collision, and how these two concepts are related to each other, okay? So let's take and uh, take yourself and let's go ahead and jump off our chair, okay? And when you jump off the chair, you have a mass, all right? <clears throat> and uh, that mass is going to stay the same whether you jump off the chair and bend your knees or jump off the chair and don't bend your knees. You're going to accelerate towards the earth at 9.8 meters per second squared, and whether you bend your knees or don't bend your knees, you're going to be going a particular velocity when you hit the floor. Okay? So therefore, you are going to have a momentum equal to that mass times the velocity. And what I want to tell you is, is that that momentum that you have <clears throat> when you hit the floor is going to be equal to the impulse or the impact, if you will. Like I said, I like that word better. It's going to be equal to the impulse that is applied to your body from the floor and that the floor applies to your body. Remember, Sir Isaac Newton said, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, okay? But for some reason, bending your knees doesn't feel that bad, but not bending your knee knees does feel bad. Why is that? Well, this impulse is force times contact time, okay? And what you do when you bend your knees is pretty simple. When you bend your knees, you increase the contact time between you and the floor, okay? And so therefore, if we increase the contact time and the impulse is the same, okay? Well, no matter how you jump, the impulse is the same because the momentum is the same, the impulse is the same, but obviously the force happens to be a lot less. So we end up with a lower force when we bend our knees because we have a greater contact time, okay? It takes us longer to land, all right? And, and this, this uh, uh, concept applies, in, 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 like I said, in a lot of ways. It's why runners wear shoes that have padding in them, okay? Because every time you take a step running, bam, your foot hits the ground with a certain amount of momentum. And to, and to decrease the force, we want that time to be a little bit longer. For those of you who run, know that your feet hurt a lot when you're running on something really hard like concrete, but when you run on something like the track out here or on nice sand to where, where, where you're, as you, as you land, it's, it's not always just landing on something really, really hard. You end up with more contact time because it squishes down. So, so the, the time is greater, so the force is less, okay? So hopefully that, that, that makes some good sense. I also like to think about, like I said, baseball players running into the wall. Now, if you're a baseball fan, you know that Wrigley Field is made of bricks on the outfield, right? 
You know, and those, the center fielder runs out there to catch a ball, hits the brick wall, and he falls down, and he's hurt. But the, the wall out in center field of, of the field in Minnesota is made of this great big foam sort of baggie. It's, it's called the baggie. And, then, and, and you, you hit it, and you sort of bounce right off. It's wonderfully fun, I bet. Okay? And so, so the idea is, is that those baseball players have the same momentum. They're going to apply the same impact when they hit the wall. But if the time is greater, their force is less and it doesn't hurt as bad. Now let's flip it and, and, and look at a different direction about why we might want to do something with a greater time or a less time, okay? So let's, let's go ahead and hit a baseball or hit a golf ball or hit a tennis ball, softball. It doesn't matter. Whatever you want to hit. Want to kick a football? It doesn't matter to me. So what I want to do now is, is I want to talk about coaches and they always say when, when, you're, when you're trying to hit something, a coach, whether you're a golf coach, a baseball coach, tennis coach, everybody says follow through. Follow through. Follow through on your swing, okay? Follow through on your kick. Um, and, and what they're trying to tell you here, whether, whether they understand physics or not, right? Okay. What they're trying to tell you here is they're trying to say increase your contact time. Increase your contact time. All right? Now let's walk our way back through the formula the other direction and understand why increasing the contact time would actually be valuable, okay? All right, so because you see, if I increase the contact time, my force is probably going to stay the same. I mean, I've only got so many muscles, I can only swing the bat so fast, all right? So my force is going to be uh, a, a constant value. I'm going to swing as hard as I can. I'm going to swing as hard as I can. But if I increase my contact time, I'm able to increase my impulse, my impact, if you will, that collision measurement that we're making. All right? What happens to all of that force times time? What happens to all of that impulse when I swing a baseball bat? Well, it gets transferred to the ball. All right? So I've got a bat and ball collision occurring and all of that impulse from that bat-ball collision gets transferred to the ball in the form of momentum. Now, if you know anything about baseball, they always have the same size of ball, don't they? The same size of ball for everybody. But what can I increase if I have a big contact time? I can eventually change the variable velocity. You see, my force can't change. I, I'm only as strong as I am. The mass of the ball won't change, but by increasing the contact time, I can make the ball go with a higher velocity. If the ball goes with a higher initial velocity, the ball is able to travel a greater distance. Makes pretty good sense, doesn't it? Or in tennis, I don't want it to go with a greater distance, I just want it to go with a higher velocity so the, guy, so the other guy on the other side of the net can't hit it back to me. If I'm in golf, I want it to go a higher distance. If I'm in football, I want to kick the ball. Or maybe if I'm in basketball, I want, I'm going to follow through. I can, I can shoot it from a further distance away. I can, I can have more control over the ball, possibly. Okay? So this is kind of a, a good way of looking at this. So, so yesterday, uh, uh, we threw an egg into a net, right? Threw an egg, and, and, and the egg didn't break when it hit a nice surface. And what was, what was happening with that surface was the ball, the, the egg, had momentum, had an impulse, no matter what we did, that, that impulse was, was, pretty, was pretty high, but it wasn't enough force to break the egg because the contact time was high. If we reduce the contact time by throwing it against a brick wall, then the, the egg's going to break, isn't it? It's or pretty simple. Floor. Or the floor. <laughs> so, I didn't say it. Someone else did. So the, um, the next thing then that we want to try to do is try to use this idea throughout. Uh, again, I think one of the coolest things to use this is because we use this throughout the idea of our sporting events, but there's also lots and lots of other practical applications. Uh, and as we get into our, uh, our, our new project, uh, which, I'll, which I'll, I'll throw out at you tomorrow, uh, we'll talk about how we can use this in the automobile industry, about how we can use the idea of impulse and contact time and time of collision in order to make our forces less, to make our automobiles and, and things like that safer. So we'll, so we'll kind of go from there. Now, one of the neat things about this activity uh, that we're, what we're doing this week with uh, uh, our experimentation is we're going to study something called the conservation of momentum. And we're going to do it with our air tracks. 
and have them undergo some collisions. We're going to run, we're going to put two carts on the air track and have them run into each other, okay? So the conservation of momentum means that um, if we ignore friction, which we can pretty well close come to doing on our air tracks, if we ignore friction, the momentum that a car has before a collision should be equal to the momentum after a collision, okay? All right, let's write this down. The momentum before our collision should be equal to the momentum after the collision. And so we're going to try to try to see if that's true. We're going to try to work through that and see how that is. Okay. So so um, I want to do a, a couple of scenarios and give you a couple of ideas about how we can then mathematically deal with this kind of stuff. All right. So let's start off. Let me get my masses here. Let's start off with a um, let's start off with a uh, dump truck. Okay. All right. I've got a dump truck, and that dump truck has a mass of about 2,000 kilograms, pretty big truck, and I've got this little itty bitty car, all right, a little car that has a mass of only 500 kilograms, okay, and uh, let's perform a couple of experiments with these two guys, okay, and we'll just keep our car and our truck this, uh, the same, and uh, uh, let's start off with a nice simple scenario that the truck's moving down the road at a, with a velocity of about 10 meters per second, the car's at rest, the truck runs into the car, and they move off together, okay? So uh, the truck has a velocity equal to 10 meters per second. It's not going very fast, you know, maybe 20, 20 some miles an hour, not very fast at all. The car is at rest, okay? And then we have a collision, okay? We have a collision, and, and they're going to stick together. They're going to go off together. They're going to go forward together. Now, I know that in the real world, if a car gets hit by a truck, the truck will probably put its brakes on and will eventually stop. Okay? But let's ignore friction and, you know, let's pretend that this is a, a big truck and there's a little car. They're sitting on ice and it rams into it and it just keeps on going. Okay? And um, we. Uh, we we kind of can imagine that in our minds that it, that, it would, that it would keep on going, but, but how fast is it is it going to go? What's going to happen to that uh, truck and car together? I know that eventually it'll stop, but we're going to try to ignore friction. What's going to happen to it as it just starts to go off together? Here's how I like to set these problems up. I like to go ahead and say momentum before is equal to momentum after, and then we're going to break down what it is when we talk about the momentum before the collision. Because we have two different things, two separate things before the collision. We've got a truck, okay? We've got a truck and it's got momentum, and we've got a car, okay? So the car's momentum and the truck's momentum before the collision are the total momentum before the collision. Now after the car, or excuse me, after the collision, uh, We've got the momentum of the uh, truck and the car together. Okay, those two guys are together. The truck and the car are are smashed together, if you will. I don't know how much they'll be smashed, but um, they'll be they'll be uh, the car is probably not in pretty good shape. Who knows? All right. So so what is before the collision the momentum of the truck? Well, the momentum of the truck before the collision would be its mass times its velocity, okay? The momentum of the truck before the collision would be its mass times its velocity, okay? That's what momentum is. The momentum of the car before the collision would be its mass times its velocity, okay? So mass times velocity of the truck, mass times velocity of the car, and we're gonna add all that up and it's going to be our total momentum before the collision ever occurs. Can you do that for me? It's pretty simple, isn't it? Okay. The momentum of the truck and the momentum of the car, all together, the total momentum before the collision is? 20,000. And that's kilogram meters per second. Okay? So before the collision ever occurs, the momentum of our system 
is 20,000. What I'm going to tell you is, is that the momentum of our system after the collision must also be 20,000. Okay? And what is the momentum of our system after the collision? Well, it's the mass of the truck and car together times the velocity of the truck and the car together. Okay? 2,500 kilograms. So what's the velocity of the car and the truck stuck together after they run into it? That it's going to slow it down, but not too much. Okay? So hopefully that answer makes a little bit of logical sense to you. Let's try a second scenario then. I'm going to, I'm going to stick with the same vehicles. So I'm going to uh, kind of get some similar uh, 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 arrangement here. My car's going 20, <coughs> okay, um, and, um, uh, and, and the truck is sitting still, okay? So here's scenario number two. The car has the velocity equal to <coughs> 20 meters per second before the collision. The truck is at rest, okay? And the cool thing about this car is, which we're going to have one on the air track cars too, you're going to like this, it has a rubber baby buggy bumper. Say that four times real fast, right? The car has rubber baby buggy bumpers on it, and um, so it bounces off. And one of the cool things about this car is, is that when the car runs into the truck, it doesn't stick to it, it bounces off, and it bounces off backwards, okay? It bounces off the truck, and it's going to go backwards. And when it goes backwards, it goes backwards with a velocity of negative 10 meters per second. Negative 10 meters per second. Again, why is it negative? It's going the other direction, right? OK? <clears throat> so my question to you, obviously, is what is the truck's velocity after the collision? OK? What is the truck's velocity after the collision? What's the truck going to do when, when the car hits it? Now, you can probably visualize this. A little itty bitty car comes running into this great big truck, and it hits it, and it bounces and goes backwards. <laughs> I mean, the truck is the truck going to even move? You know? Now, on a friction surface, the truck may not even move. But we can think about things like, for instance, what about if this were to occur in outer space? or on ice, okay? So that's what we're doing. And the reason why we're doing it that way is because throwing in the concept of friction makes the problems more difficult. And we're going to start off with some basic problems, <clears throat> and then we'll kind of throw in some other ideas as we go, okay? So let's go back to this general setup that I had here. The momentum before a collision is equal to the momentum after the collision. So I've got the momentum of the truck and the momentum of the car should be equal to the momentum of the truck plus the momentum of the car. So the momentum of the truck before plus the momentum of the car before is equal to the momentum of the truck after plus the momentum of the car after. And again, I'm just kind of breaking it down, kind of organizing my thoughts, OK? <clears throat> the momentum of the truck before the collision, what is it? Zero, right. Those are easy to calculate, right? The velocity is zero, so the momentum is zero. The momentum of the car before the collision would be 500 kilograms times 20 meters per second, OK? 500 kilograms times 20 meters per second, OK? <clears throat> what is it? 10,000. 10, Very good. So the whole momentum before the collision ever occurs is, has a value of, of uh, 10,000, OK? So that's what it's going to have to be afterwards. It will be less if we have friction, OK? So that's what we're going to have. The truck, after the collision, I don't know its momentum. But I know that its momentum would be 2,000 kilograms times the velocity that the truck would have after the collision. OK? So far, so good? The momentum of the truck after the collision would be its mass times its velocity. We're trying to find the velocity, so I'll leave that as the variable. What about the momentum of the car? It would be its mass times its velocity. 
And again, it's important to include the negative here because once the car hits the truck, he slows and goes backwards. Okay? <clears throat> All right, so let's solve and see what we've got so far. 20,000 times, excuse me, 2,000 times V plus negative 5,000. Okay? I'm going to do a little bit of algebra here. It's fun. All right? I'm going to add 5,000 to both sides. And again, I'm adding 5,000 kilogram meters per second. I got the same units, so I can do this. All right? And I end up with 15,000 is equal to 2,000 V. And I can do that one in my head. Okay? Is it realistic? Probably not. Not in our world. Okay? But it does give us an idea about how some things can work, and then we can, like I said, we can throw in some ideas about momentum uh, when, when, when friction gets involved. Okay? Liz was talking to me yesterday about the movie Gravity. I gotta go see the movie Gravity because all kinds of cool physics stuff out in outer space. And these laws of momentum have some really great concepts when we actually get out in outer space and there's no friction involved. We can really apply some of these pretty cool. You're also going to do a couple of scenarios in your experimentation where you take a, uh, <clears throat> where you take a, uh, a car and you run it into another car and this one will shoot forward and this one will kind of go forward slowly. So we've got a couple of different scenarios. We've got our air track set up so that, so that we can either run cars into each other and they stick together or we can run cars into each other and they'll bounce off of each other. So we're going to try to look at a couple of different scenarios. On the worksheet, you're going to do an activity where you're going to take a little car and you're going to run it right into a force sensor, okay? And uh, our, our computers will be able to measure how much time you're in contact with the force sensor and the force that you're applying. So you're actually measuring the impulse. And, uh, and uh, the backtrack can calculate your velocity of your car by knowing your momentum. So we're going to try to manipulate uh, our, our formulas in, in, in a couple of different ways in, the, in that respect. I think you'll like it. Um, when we when we get to uh, um, okay, check my time. When we get to the idea then of, of of our enrichment, one of the things that I'm going to do is throw at you uh, moving these things at different angles. Right now, what we're going to study in our worksheet and our experiments is just linear momentum. Everything will be in a straight line. Okay. What happens when I take this then? And, uh, and again, I'm just trying to entice you to look at the uh, enrichment because I think it's pretty cool. Uh, what about if I uh, uh, apply these concepts to playing pool? Anybody play pool? I love playing pool. And the physics and the geometry involved in playing pool. Pretty neat stuff. I'm going to take the, uh, the eight ball and I'm going to shoot the cue, cue ball right at it. Okay? Well, that's my goal, is to maybe hit it straight on, but I'm not that good, actually. And a lot of times I don't hit it straight on. And so, like the eight ball, will go off in this direction, okay? And the reason why it's going off in that direction is because it has a forward vector, uh, a forward momentum vector, and a downward uh, um, momentum vector, okay? Now, what's going to happen then to the, the cue ball? Well, if you play enough pool, you could probably know, and if you just look at this common sense-wise, you could probably understand that the cue ball has to do the opposite. It's going to, <coughs> excuse me, it's going to uh, continue on so that the, mo the, the vector that we initially started with will, will, will add up, but then because we've got a downward vector, we have to have an upward vector. So we get our cue ball moving in a different direction. So, so that's the enrichment activity, looking at momentum moving in different directions. And so I think it's kind of cool uh, tying in with what we just finished with, some very simple right angle trig with, with some of the stuff that we're doing here. But we don't have enough time to do that with all of our stuff because, believe it or not, we also want to study something called angular momentum. Okay? Angular momentum. All right? So we're going to do linear momentum, and we're going to study angular momentum, and then vector momentum is going to be saved for the enrichment activity. What I mean by angular momentum is uh, the idea that, um, well, well, let's just start off this way. We're going to have something moving in a circle, okay? We're going to have something moving at an angle or something moving around, and we want to study the momentum of something going around in a circle, okay? So um, the momentum 
of an object moving in a circle, okay? And we can also apply that to partial circles, <clears throat> but we're going to try to take a look at things moving around in circles. Well, here's, here's one of the interesting things about angular momentum and, uh, and how we're going to deal with it in, in, uh, in, our, in our class here. What I want to do is I want you to understand that when we are looking at objects and their angular momentum, we must, as we do with linear momentum, consider the mass of the object. Okay? The mass is important in, in, in what we're studying. Okay? The velocity is also important into what we're studying, okay? So that's what linear momentum is, right? Mass and velocity. So how is angular momentum different? Well, the reason what really makes angular momentum different is actually one more thing which you might have experienced. Now, when I go uh, figure skating, um, I go figure skating, one of my favorite things to do when I go figure skating is I like to start going around in a circle. And so I start figure skating, I get up on one skate and I start going around in a circle and then I pull my arms in really, really close. And what happens to me? I go really fast, yes. Okay, I was just kidding, I don't figure skate. Don't look at me like that. Okay. But wouldn't it be pretty cool if you could? You know, I watch those people on TV, I think it's pretty neat. You know? So they're going around in a circle, and they're going around in a circle, and they're going around in a circle, and all of a sudden they pull their arms in, and, and, and they start going around a lot faster in the circle. And so what we have to consider with our angular momentum is the variable that what they're doing is, is that they're changing their radius, okay? They've got their arms out. They've got a great big old radius. Their mass is distributed over a wider area. And then all of a sudden, they've got their mass all distributed really, really close into the center, okay? Well, you see, if, if, if this right here is not going to change, I mean, I'm out there figure skating. My mass isn't going to change. I've got a constant mass. By changing the radius, okay, by the radius going down, Something's got to give, and that thing that gives is the velocity must go up. You see, when you're figure skating, when you're going around in a circle like that, there's very little friction. So you still have to have conservation of momentum. You can't lose or gain momentum. You're going to have to stay at the same momentum. That's what the law says, and it's true. So therefore, by reducing our radius, our momentum then will cause our velocity to go up. So it's kind of a really cool experience. Now, what you're going to do, and maybe you've done it before in other classes, but we're going to sit on a, on a stool that spins, and we're going to, we're going to change the, 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 what we call the center of our mass. We're going, to, we're going to change our radius. We're going to hold our hands out and bring them back in. We're also going to look at a, at a wheel, a really, 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 really heavy uh, rimmed wheel, um, and, and we're, going to, we're going to spin it, and we're going to take a look at it moving around in a circle and see how changing its, uh, not its radius, but changing its velocity by changing its direction will, will help us change <coughs> the, the speed and, and, and what kind of force is racking on it. How many of you ride motorcycles? Anybody ride a motorcycle? Good. I've got a couple of good examples then. Because when you turn a motorcycle, you actually use angular momentum to turn the motorcycle. When we turn a car, we, we literally turn the wheels, right? When you turn a motorcycle, you don't turn the wheels you use angular momentum, and we're going to try to understand uh, how that works. So it's kind of cool. I think you'll like it. Okay? Any general questions? Now let's talk just a, briefly about the two things that I um, uh, had yesterday, and then I think I will, I've uh, got time, I think I will go ahead and do your project today. Um, uh, go ahead and turn that off for a second and give me just a minute.